this morning. We also want to take the opportunity to welcome all our online worshippers and participants this morning, those who did not make it because of various reasons, illnesses, etc. Joining us online, greetings, salutations to you, and may the word of the Lord do you good in this time and this season. Amen. Greetings to you all. I'd like to just take a special opportunity to wish a special friend of mine from so many years back, Glenn Henry and his partner, Mrs. Henry. Thank you so much for visiting with us. Just raise a hand so that we can see it. Give them a warm beer mind. Blessings to you all. Right. Praise God. As you know, we start with a bit of prayer points and then we get into some ministry of the Word because it's important to pray. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. So we have our intercessors that come very early and they start praying for the ministry, praying for the service, and then now, as the Lord lays word on their heart, they share the word with us. So the word submitted this morning is found in Habakkuk, 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 however you say it, South African version, American version, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, and it reads as follows, the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Amen. So that's a word of encouragement right out of, out of the word for us this morning. To hold on to the faith where this year is concerned, where the church is concerned, and the future of the church is concerned. Amen. Amen. Can I just say this? As we take up this prayer point today, I want you to join me in prayer as we pray this prayer point up. But I want, I want you to listen closely to how we're going to craft it and how we're going to pray it. Okay, so you've got the scripture there for your reference. But I want to pray that in future we have more Holy Ghost filled services. We have services more where the presence of God shows up than the presence of men. Because wherever Jesus is, people come. People follow him. Jesus is the magnet, the anointing is the magnet that brings people, amen. amen. So don't be too concerned with numbers. Ask yourself, is the Lord in the house? That's important going forward to have a witness from you. Amen. Something disturbing happened. I don't know if it was one of the sisters or brothers from this church sent me a little video. And in this video, there's a very well-known popular comedian who makes a joke out of churches. And uh, in this little video, he says, well, I see churches are online now. No, nobody goes to church anymore. Well, why not? Because God himself don't show up for services. Now, firstly, let us pray for that entertainer. Because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You don't take up issue with God and get away with it. And you've done mocking people and you've done mocking the governments of the land. Who's next? God, be careful, government may not speak out, but fire still comes down from heaven. So firstly, firstly we pray for that entertainer, that God will convict him and he'll repent of his ways. Yeah, but I, I, as I had that episode, and then the Lord laid this on my heart, and said, could it be that for good reason, the world is looking at the church and saying, God, don't show up? And I said, wait, wait a minute, we got a responsibility here. In terms of ensuring that God's presence does show up. And this is a heartfelt prayer for the new year. That we will pray for services with God's presence. And like Moses said, Lord, do not send us from here unless your presence goes with us. That we do not leave the study of preparation of ministry of the word without saying, now Lord, unless you go with us. I may have a good word, but without you, that word is pointless. So let us pray this morning. Father, thank you. As we pray over this word, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, we pray for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our midst. The church is about the Holy Spirit, Lord God. And without His presence, we are aimless and we are pointless at what we are doing. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that brings a witness with our spirit that we are the sons and we are the daughters of God. The Holy Spirit brings the comfort of God to us in a time where we are filled with dread and filled with fear. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction of God that is vital and is necessary to change our ways and bring forth repentful people before the throne of God. So thank you for the presence of God. Thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let us not go 
overlook that in the course of this year, Lord, as we pursue your will for us in this wonderful new year. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name, that the church will be mindful of this point that we've made this morning and be mindful to pray about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you comfortable with that prayer point? We'll take one or two before we get into the ministry of the word. And as I was pondering that church, I said to myself, there's that portion of scripture, I think it's 1 Kings 19, where Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. And the 450 prophets of Baal are there. And it's the unrighteous who challenges the righteous. It's darkness versus light. It was a conflict. It came to a hill that day on Mount Carmel. And so Elijah begins to mock them and says, your God's sleeping. Perhaps he's taking a nap. Shout a little louder. And the prophets of Baal shout louder. Fire come down from heaven. Fire and nothing happens. And then he says, do some more. And they begin to cut themselves. And nothing. No fire comes down from heaven. And then Elijah steps up. And he reorganizes the altar. And fire comes down. And I said to myself, and the Lord convicted me and said, there's something wrong with that picture. Because today in the church, Christians are doing what the 450 prophets of Baal did so many years ago. We're the ones cutting, gnashing out and saying, presence of God, fire fall, and nothing's happening. But the heathen outside seem to be having a response from the foreign gods. What's happening? Something's wrong, child of God. It's time for us to earnestly cry out to God, to arrange the altars of the church where priority becomes priority, God comes first, and all the other things take their position behind them. Then the fire will fall. Then the 450 prophets of Baal will look at us and say, truly, God lives with them. God's in the church. And the entertainers will not mock anymore. They might find something else to laugh about, but it will be the presence and the power of God. Can you say amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. So on the prayer points, I want to pray further for you and for the church that the Father would compel every destiny helper to assist you in the course of your life. We're going to pray this way. We're going to say, Father, compel every destiny helper to favor my righteous cause all through the year of 2022. Amen. As you know, we've started the year strong. We're taking a hold of it and we are praying it into manifestation. Not waiting to see the manifestation, but praying the manifestation. Amen. Let's pray. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray this morning over every person bowed in your presence today. Each one has purpose and they have destiny where their lives are concerned. There's calling over people's lives. There's destiny over people's lives. And I pray that the destiny helpers that you have designed and designated to help us, that Father, they will favor our righteous cause and begin to move towards us. Many will assist and not resist the enemy. Many will come and stumble over in their willingness to help and to assist the ministry and to assist the people of this house. There are people, Lord God, business people, that need divine destiny helpers to cross their path, to assist them. The pharaohs that would finance the Josephs of the house. By God, I pray our destiny helpers cross paths with us. Even in the month of January, Lord, our destiny helpers will cross paths with us, by God. They will favor the righteous cause of God over us and over our lives. And Father, we pray these mercies in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said amen and amen. amen. Lastly, Father, direct my steps. Connect me to my destiny, causing me to continually change levels all through this year in Jesus' name. May every month be a new level for you, a new level of your existence, a new level of your walking with God. Hallelujah. Father, thank you in Jesus' name as we pray this over this congregation, over those that are watching and trusting God online with us, Lord, those who are in the house this morning that place an insistence on this prayer point, Lord, direct my steps. Connect me to my destiny in this year like never before. In Jesus' wonderful name. Everyone said, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's open our hearts now to some ministry of the word. And we pray that God will do us good. The ministry of the word will do us good in this time. Amen. Are we ready? Are we comfortable? Are we good with that? Praise the Lord. Now, as we said to you, events invite, the new is here. And because we are living in a new era and a new season, we must step into it daily. Connect with it daily and say, Lord, let your perfect will be done in my life today. 
Lord, today I do not allow my life to be used of the enemy. Lord, my life is a billboard of your advertisement, of your salvation, your goodness, and your promises. I will not allow my life to be used as a billboard for Satan to advertise sickness, disease, and poverty. Because he gets the glory from all, out of all of those negative things. But God gets the glory from healing, delivering, setting you free, and setting you apart, and setting you on high. Amen. Hallelujah. So the new can be something that has never been seen before. We are talking about the new in 2022. So your new could be something you've never seen before. A better quality of what you've been developing, accomplishing, and embracing. And so in light of that, here are four things that will put you in good state for 2022. Amen. Praise the Lord. Four little pointers very quickly. And um, it's going to bless you this morning. Point number one, realize, start of this year, that you are completely accepted. You are completely accepted in the faith. Titus 3 verse 7 says you are completely accepted and Jesus has made us acceptable to God. What an awesome portion of scripture that just ministers to the heart of believers and unbelievers. Jesus has made us acceptable to God. What Jesus did on the cross made you completely acceptable to God. No matter what you have done and no matter what you will do in the future. Personally, I know when talking to people and reflecting upon my life personally, I know that people tend to accept parts of our existence and we reject the other parts. There's the good part of you that you accept and then there's the negative part of you that you reject. Now if you're in a relationship with someone and if you're in a marriage, then your partner's quick to point out your strengths and your weaknesses. And sometimes what we tend to do is we buy into that and we recognize our weaknesses and we reject our weaknesses but we accept our strengths. So there's things about you you like and there's things about you you don't like. But this morning I'm trying to get you to see that God has completely and totally accepted you. If I were to get you to stand up and testify about your faith in your Christianity, you'll tell me about the things you are doing right. You won't tell me about the negative things. Why is that? Because we tend to reject what is negative and what is wrong about us. But the message is God has completely accepted you, totally accepted you. And you must forgive me this morning because I'm going to move into the superlatives. Not accepted, but completely accepted. And those are relative. But I need for you to see that God has completely accepted you this morning. You have spent so much of your time trying to earn acceptance from parents, from peers. How many of you are still going through that struggle in life? You're going through that struggle in a marriage and in a relationship. You're still trying to do good enough to be accepted totally by someone. You're trying that with your family. You're trying that with your peers. We try that in church. We try to impress. We try to help. We try to overstep the mark in order to be completely accepted. And you know where human nature is concerned? You'll never be good enough for another human being. How many of you know that? They'll always find fault. Something is wrong in what you're doing. The tea may be perfect, but it hasn't got enough sugar. People are like that. But when it comes to our Father in heaven, we are completely accepted. Amen. Completely accepted. Praise God for that. You have been accepted in the beloved, the part of the family of God. And you're part of the family of God. Named after the family in heaven. Hallelujah. You are named after the family of God in heaven. I have a sense of belonging now. I no longer aimlessly wander through the earth. I see we've received news that some of our students have graduated, matriculated, and they've matriculated with flying colors. And many of those young people now will be applying to the many prestigious colleges throughout the land. And what a wonderful moment it is when you get it in the news. Nowadays, I don't know, you get it online or WhatsApp, I don't know. But back in the day, we used to get a letter of confirmation. And the letter used to read, you have been accepted. How many of you remember that? What a wonderful feeling when you apply to a prestigious college. And you get back the report, you have been accepted. It doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter what clothing you wear, how much you earn, how much your parents earn. Because you know when you're accepted into that prestigious college, you begin to rank with the people that are accepted. The rich and famous are in the college. Now you can 
you can rub in it with them, you can hop knock with them, and you're right next to them. There's no discrimination anymore. The same college has accepted you. The same varsity has accepted you. Child of God, begin to understand that the kingdom of heaven has accepted us. It doesn't matter how much you earn. It doesn't matter what background you have. We have the same privileges now. Glory to God afforded to us. We have been fully accepted. And it's time you took a look at yourself and said, okay, I think I need to accept myself now, right here and now, as I am. Amen. Praise the Lord. You see, Jesus has pre-qualified us. Now just follow the formality and enjoy what's rightfully yours. There are many here who are homeowners and you know what the situation is like. You approach a bank for a bond, a loan, but in, uh, in many cases you get pre-qualified. I mean, if you're a serious home hunter, home hunter, you don't do things back to front. You get pre-qualified. You ensure that all four banks in the land, the major banks, are willing to grant you a bond. And then once you're pre-qualified, you go looking for a home. And upon finding it, you then make formal application. And 90% of the time, it goes off without hitch. You can give it your bond. Your bond gets granted. But you are pre-qualified. Now listen to this. Jesus has pre-qualified you to be accepted in heaven, to be accepted in the faith, to be accepted by the Father. Now all you've got to do is work it out. That's why the Bible says working out your own salvation in fear and trembling. you got the package deal. You've got the pre-approval. Now you just need to work it out, follow the formality, sign where it's necessary, and you get what salvation promises you. Come on now, child of God. You have been pre-qualified. Jesus has made you acceptable in the sight of God. God's not waiting to accept you. Many of you have been accepted. You just don't realize it. Need to go home and read the mail. You've been accepted by half in heaven. Come on. Yay in heaven. You've been accepted. Come on now. You just need to do the right thing in the formalities and step up to the plate. You say, now that I'm accepted, what am I entitled to? So let's find out this morning as we delve into the message, what am I entitled to? Let's find out. Now that you've been accepted in the faith, the Bible says there is neither Greek, nor Jew, nor Gentile. There is no favoritism with God. There is no favoritism. Whether you were in the past Greek, Jew, or Gentile, you are now seen as one in God. And isn't that a wonderful feeling? I mean, every now and again, we know, we know, and I don't mean to offend or hurt anyone, but we know that racism has been supposedly dealt with in the new constitution, the new democracy. But now and again, you kind of see it in certain places where there's discrimination, and if you don't fit the profile, you left out. And it's a horrible feeling because it's a feeling of rejection. And we don't want to feel rejected in the kingdom of God. But number one, thing that you want is acceptance. That's what every human being wants. And that's what we prayed for last week. That as people enter the house, they will feel accepted in the house. They'll feel the welcoming presence of God that says, you are my child. You're accepted. You're welcome. We want to feel welcome. Amen. And the kingdom of God gives us that. It says there's neither Greek nor Jew nor Gentile. And then listen to this. It says we are grafted into the vine. We are grafted into the vine. We were a wild olive tree, but he took us from the root system of that system and grafted us into the true vine. Now we can tap into his roots and draw upon his righteousness and holiness. Amen. We've been given an inheritance in Christ. We are partakers of his holiness. Don't be shy in that regard. Pray for his holiness. Thank you, Lord, for your holiness. It's now my portion. It's now my portion. Because we've been accepted in the faith and given an eternal dwelling place in heaven. Amen. How many of you know you won't lose your place? You know, if you make a booking right now, I would all the havoc that uh, COVID-19 has wreaked in the entertainment industry and uh, in the, uh, you know, the uh, holiday industry. Many people have made holiday plans, but for some reason they could not honor those holiday plans, so, so they could not pitch up for their holiday. So how many of you know you lose that holiday, in a sense? It's not going to just stay there every day, any day, whatever day you go, no, your holiday is just waiting. You lose it, you see it. But we never lose or cede our position in heaven. Whether you 
going to live another 10 years. God bless you with long life and longevity. You're going to live till 120 like some people are pushing for. Praise the Lord. You'll still not lose out on your position in heaven. You have a dwelling up in heaven according to Romans 14. They might have to just keep changing the paint because you're taking so long to get there. But they're preparing it for you and it's there. You will never lose it. You will never lose that position in God. Amen. Amen. And so there's a scripture that goes and it really ministers to me. It says, as Jesus is in heaven, so are we here on earth. Isn't that a wonderful scripture? As he is in heaven, so are we on earth. So as he goes, he goes. And I want you to pray this every day. You wake up on Monday and you say, Lord Jesus, as you are, so am I. As you go, so I go today. And I pray that constantly over myself. Because as he is, so am I. My success, my path, my, my way forward is not determined by the world or Satan. It's determined by him and by who he is and the position that he's in. Amen. So as he is, so am I here on earth. And then I take the prayer point a point further and I say, Lord, as we as parents go, so too our children. Because our children are entitled to the blessings we are enjoying. So we say, as we go as parents, so to our children, Lord. As we are doing well, they shall do well. As we know the Lord, they shall know the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so we take it a little further here on earth. And lastly, we can come with boldness to the throne of God, knowing that we are completely accepted in the faith. Listen, child of God, you cannot approach the throne. You cannot approach our Heavenly Father in prayer or in praise if you don't know He's going to accept you. Before I move on to my next point, you need to make that clear. You need to settle that in your heart. Have you had doubts? This morning, remove all elements of doubt and just say thank you, Lord, this morning. In fact, I'm going to pray that. You pray that in your heart. I'm going to pray that for you. Watch this. Thank you, Lord, that I have been totally, completely accepted in the faith. And Father, you hold no reservations against me and against my life. But I'm totally accepted. I receive that by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now watch this. Now the second point. You are unconditionally loved by God. You are unconditionally loved by God. In Isaiah 54 verse 10, the Bible reads, Though the mountains and the hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. You need to understand that this morning, that you are unconditionally loved by the Father this morning. In Isaiah 54, just another portion of scripture, and verse 17, he says, For a small moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. Verse 10, the mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, neither my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy upon you. Every day you need to remind yourself that God thinks about you. Did you get that this morning? Remind yourself that God thinks about you every day. And what He thinks about you is only good. In Jeremiah He says, the thoughts that I have towards you are good and not for evil. And David says, He thinks about me all the time. He has a multitude of thoughts that He has towards me during the course of the day. Now listen to this, I'm going to get into a portion of scripture, and I really want to challenge your faith just a little bit down here. We read about God's love, amen, in books, in devotions, and in the Bible. We hear about it like you are hearing about the love of God this morning, but are you truly convinced? Are you truly convinced of His love for you, that He loves you, but more importantly that He loves you unconditionally? Stop sitting there and thinking, if I can only get to do that, God will love me more. If I can only overcome that sin, God will love me more. If I can get to the point where I'm tithing so much, God will love me like he loves that rich guy or that lady there. If I can worship like that worship leader, God will love me more. If I can preach like that preacher, God will love me more. Listen, God loves you unconditionally. Right here, right now, where you are seated, just as you are. Come as you are is the gospel message. He loves you unconditionally. But many of us don't have a reality of that love. We just know it. It's like, you know, in family circles, we walk around and we say, hello, how are you? Do this, do that. And then we say goodbye. We say, love you. And you say, love you even more. I mean, if you know what I'm talking about. 
But you don't walk out the door thinking about them. Wow, love you all. When they come out there, boss, I'll be late for work. I'm thinking about something. No, we just brush over it. We carry on with our lives. That's what we do with the love of God. We're just waiting now to get to the next point in this message. Some of us are No, 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 stop. Think about this. God loves you unconditionally. Stop saying, for God so loved the world. You must say, for God so loved me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When salvation came, we didn't get a package salvation. Salvation came personally to you. Individually to you. God forgave your sins. So God loves you. So you must say, God loves me personally. Hallelujah. And if we do, it will it will totally change everything about us and around us. It's that love that caused Jesus to lay down his life for us. The love of God. God demonstrated his love. It's that love that says to us, even though we feel unworthy, God says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden and are burdened, I shall give you rest. Come as you are, despite your sins, your shortcomings, and your failures. Hallelujah. You were loved in heaven before you were known on earth. God loved you in heaven before you showed up. Sometimes I laugh at myself. I look in the mirror and I say, you, not that 19-year-old guy anymore, Lord. Do you still love this old man? God says, oh, no, he doesn't even say anything. You just feel his comfort and his acceptance. He says, no, I'm not waiting for you to grow older, to look any better, get any richer. My love is unmoved and undetermined and unfazed. He loves us. But he loved you before you were born. You need to get a hold of that. We're struggling with accepting God's love for us now because you're a Christian of 10, 20 years. You're struggling in and out of ministry, in, in ministry, doing this, doing that, and you're doubting the love of God. Don't doubt it. He loved you before you were born. Did you know that? Did you know that? <laughs> Watch this. You've been conformed into the image of God. You're a diamond, a rose, a jewel, purchased by the blood of Jesus. In the eyes of God, you're worth dying for. You're being made perfect, but God has a wild, inexplicable, mad love for you. So wait, listen to this now. You don't have to wait to do anything well or good in order to get into God's good books. God loves you. And realize he's not going to love you anymore tomorrow when you bump up your tithes, when you step up the number of times you attend church in a month, when you increase your prayer time and your worship. God's not going to say, oh, let me send him a message. I love you more. No, but you're going to grow in the revelation of the love he already has for you. We don't need to ask God for more love than the love was poured out 2,000 years ago. You need to grow in terms of the knowledge of how much. Hallelujah. Get it? The Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost. You can't ask for more of it. You've got to open up your heart and make room yeah. for more. Yeah. Same with the love of God. We've got to make room for it in our thinking and in our knowledge and realize He loves me, but with such a vast and a great love. Hallelujah. He loved you. He decided on that a long time ago. You need to grow in the awareness of the existence of His love. John 3 verse 16, God's not waiting to love you. He determined that already. For God's soul loved the world. Where were you when he said that? You were in his vision, in his plan when he said, for God so loved the world. So he loved you before you were born. You're just walking into his love now that you're here in salvation. Listen, church. All you have to do now, according to 1 John chapter 4 verse 16, 1 John chapter 4 verse 16 says that we may come to know the love of God and believe it. There are two things in 1 John 4 verse 16. We've got to come to know the love of God and we've got to believe it. Two important parts of 1 John 4 verse 16. You've got to know it through the Greek word gnosko that means to experience it. God's love cannot be spoken about. It must be experienced. And more often than not, in times of worship, when you close your hands and you close your eyes and your hands are raised, you get raptured up, caught up in the love and presence of God. And you've got to experience His love. And we experience it in many different ways. I'll show you in just a little while.
well, time permitting, that is. And then you've got to believe it. Just like you believe for salvation, you must believe the love of God that He has for you. That God loves you unconditionally. And like I said, this will change your life going forward. Change your life going forward. What a shame that people suffer at the hands of sickness, disease, and every other cursed thing just because they can't believe the love of God that God has for them. The love of God is greater than the devil's power of sickness, than the devil's power of poverty, and whatever else the devil can muster up, put together, level against you, and attack you with. The love of God is greater than anything the devil can do. The love of God is greater than the devil's hatred of you. God said this to me to say to you, a lot of the stuff that you're going through, it's not that God's permitting it. It's because the devil hates you because God loves you. A lot of what the church is going through is the devil's hatred for us because of God's love for us. He's not punishing the world. He's punishing the church because the church is an expression and a receptacle of the love of God. And when all of this is said and done and church is over and we are one day reunited with the Lord, it's going to be about His love that continues. So let us come to know the love of God. Let us know it, experience it, and then let us believe it. Because that is your greatest testimony. You can tell the world that Jesus died and rose again and all of those preaching points are good. You can talk about the Adamic sin and the solution that's in Christ and you must teach that and preach that to the unsaved world. But tell them about the love of God and every hardened heart will melt because all the world wants, the unsaved world out there is to be loved unconditionally. Their hearts will melt. The love of God. The love of God. What a shame we suffer at the hands of situation. Now if you're going through any of these things, sickness, disease, poverty, whatever the enemy is they're thrown at you, convince yourself of the love of God and say, your love for me is greater than what I'm going through. Your love for me is greater than what pain I have in my body. Your love for me is greater than this problem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Believe the love of God. It's been released in the blood of Jesus. Believe the love of God. It's been released in the name of Jesus. Believe the love of God. It's been released in His Word. And 1 John 3 verse 16, 1 John 4 verse 16, just clarify, 1 John 4 verse 16, I'm still on that verse. John the Apostle speaks to people in the church and he says, listen to his words, we have known and believed the love of God. And now he's preaching to people to people that need to be convinced of the love of God. Now John was the original, amongst the original 12 apostles, and they saw Jesus. And he was known as the beloved disciple because he always loved to lean on Jesus. At the dinner table, at the Lost Supper, he leaned on Jesus. He's the only disciple that was not killed or martyred and physically, but lived out his natural years, so they say. The only disciple, and he's known as the beloved disciple of Jesus. So he knew about the love of God and the love of Jesus. And so he says, we have known the love. Church, I need you to go out and tell the world, we have known. Don't go and preach to them and say, we are learning about the love of God. You're going to say, we have known it. Now we are telling you about it. We believe it. Now we're getting you to believe it. The love of God. Have you reached that point or do you need to be convinced? Before I move on to my next point, we need to make right with God with that. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And watch this. Know that you are loved. And His love is a caring love. You know, we pray about a lot of things in life. And we got our prayer points and our grocery list of 1 to 10. Lord bless this, Lord give me that. Lord bless this, Lord give me that. We got our grocery list. And that's okay. Jesus encourages us to pray about our daily needs. But when you are convinced of the love of God, and you go into prayer, and you start talking about His love, and just enjoying His love, you forget about what you need to pray for. Because you are reminded that God knows what's troubling you anyway. And sometimes before you can get to ask Him for something, He gets to talk to you about it. Because His love is a caring love. He's not going to just enjoy your presence and say, go away. I can't help you today. His love is a caring love. When we come into His presence, it's that care that He shows us. And sometimes, you know what, whatever you're going through that's causing fear, the fear goes away. Remember when a child was, when, as children, when we were growing up at night, you see a shadow, 
The wind would blow at night, you get so scared, you'd run. Who did you run to? You didn't run to the shadow, you ran away from it and you ran to mom and dad. The shadow was still there, the problem was still there, but there was comfort as you hung on to their legs, clung to dad's leg. There's this comfort when you run into his presence. The problem may still be there, but there's a comfort from knowing I'm in your presence. And whatever's out there cannot affect me, cannot hurt me. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The love of God. Amen. So John says we have known this love, and this is what we are trying to say to you. What immense comes to you from knowing and believing that God loves me? Things may be scarce, blessings and breakthroughs still on the way. Did you get that? Things may be scarce, blessings and breakthroughs are still on the way. Isn't it amazing? Most of what we're praying for is still on the way. DHL is really slow. They need to step up. Those angels that are running God's DHL section, his career section. 2022, we believe that it's going to be a year of quick things as well. Believe with me and believe for me as I believe for you. DHL is going to step up. Arts are going to come quick. But in the meantime, the love of God is what we have. And it's what gives us comfort while waiting for that thing to materialize in our lives. Amen. As I said, you can be so comfortable, you can become so caught up with his love. And realize this. I want to share this with you. It's found in um, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And God spoke to Jeremiah and he said to him, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew you. God decided he loved you then. God's not waiting for you to do anything monumental. Miraculous in order to love you, he loves you already. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's move on. You are totally forgiven. Four things put you in a good position in 2022. The third thing is you are totally forgiven. And as I said, forgive me for embracing and using the style of teaching with superlatives. I can just say you are forgiven, and that preaches. But I'm saying you are totally forgiven because it must eradicate some wrong teachings that we sometimes make provision for in our lives. And because Jesus died on the cross and gave his life as payment for your sins, you are totally forgiven when you accept God's gift of forgiveness. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is now, can we say that together? There is now, therefore, no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why no condemnation? Because your sins are all forgiven. Past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. Now, you need to track with me. Because the, the, the teaching on, on forgiveness and the love of God begins to take a different angle. I might challenge your theology, but stay with me. It's still biblical and it's still sound. Stay with me. God's not waiting for you to repent in order to be forgiven. He has forgiven you the day you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Now this is good teaching right here because when you lead people to Christ, you must say, you must teach them to say after you, I repent of my sin and God forgives me of my sin past, present and future. Or else that same convert will go out, make a mistake, Fall into sin and think, I'm not a good Christian. They need to be taught this. Yes. That God forgives you past, present, and future. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, he says, I knew you before you were born. He even saw your sins. So what are you trying to hide that thing for? What are you trying to hide it? He saw it even before you were born. And he decided, I love you. And he decided, I'm going to forgive you. So why are you stressing with that thing? Come on, why are you stressing with that thing so much? If only they find this out. If only they learn that about me. God knew about it. He knows about it. What's this stuff? He decided to forgive you. But it is good to acknowledge your shortcomings and repent accordingly. And you know, you just carry on with your relationship with God and you go, okay, yes sir. No, that's good. Lord. No, I, I repent of that. No, it's not a good thing to show people finger in traffic while I'm driving. Okay, no, 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 no. And, and you just go on with your relationship. You don't let sin drive you to the point that you say, no, I'm going to work, I've sinned, but let me rather go back home, fall on my knees and pray about what I've done wrong in traffic, and then I'll go to work. No, you don't, you don't do ridiculous really things like that. You just sort of repent as you're going along. Yes. In the shopping mall, someone bumps you, someone's taking too long, you get agitated, very soon the Spirit of God says, calm down, 
Be patient. Forgive that person that cuts you off. Okay, okay, okay. You just carry on. It's like when you are married. You said your I do's, you got the ring on, you married now. But you have little tiffs and altercations in the marriage, verbal ones. So after you make up, you don't come to the altar and get remarried. <laughs> because you already married. Yes. Now when you're saved, you're already saved. Yes. You don't come to the altar every week and say, 10 sins this week, 15 sins this week. You just repent of them. You're still in relationship with God. You haven't broken off fellowship with God. The story of the prodigal son is so amazing. When he came back home, the father saw him from afar. God can see you from afar and he loves you. The father didn't wait for him at the gate and say, we're back home now. Mm -hmm. So come on, tell us, what were you doing? Why did you do that? Give him acceptance. No condemnation, but God gave him acceptance. He was accepted and he was forgiven. Hallelujah. So watch this now. Your sins, past tense, are forgiven. You repent of sin, not that you need to be forgiven, but because you are already forgiven. When he said, I forgive you, he's forgiven you past, present, and future. You're not repenting to get forgiveness. You're repenting because you've got forgiveness. Every time we pray for a sick person, we don't get Jesus to come into the world and go die on the cross again. We take what was done 2,000 years ago and apply it. Same with forgiveness. Hallelujah. Amen. So listen to what the Bible says. But Jesus, our perfect new covenant high priest, offered complete, perfect sacrifice once and for all when he offered up himself. Hebrews 7 verse 27. He offered himself up for us, for our sins, once and for all. So he doesn't have to die every time we repent. Now we break bread once a month, and uh, we're going to give you the covenant date, I believe it's next week. But we'll wait for the announcements and we'll show you the exact date, give you the exact date. But when we break bread, we're not waiting to be forgiven. We're breaking bread because we are forgiven. You are forgiven. You know, when I got that realization and revelation, it changed the way I operated with God. It changed the dynamics of my relationship. It changed it. I'm already forgiven. Can I help you? In case you're struggling with it. You know, as you talk to people now with the pandemic and with the strange weather patterns and strange things going on, people say, rapture, eh? Rapture's around the corner. Ask you a question, are you rapturing? You've got to realize that when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior five years ago, ten years ago, He made you rapture ready. Already. <laughs> you are ready. There's nothing more you can do. You can save more souls. Let's do that. You can come to church more often. Let's do that. Let's do more for the kingdom. That's all for rewards in heaven. But you are rapture ready when you receive Jesus because there's no sin that's outstanding or speaking against you. His blood has washed it all away. But it's better for you to grow in the revelation of the sin so that you can depart from them and walk in more righteousness. Amen. Amen. If, if you hold on to the mentality, every time I repent of my sin, Jesus must forgive me. It means he must die daily. And he doesn't die daily. He died once and for all, for all of our sins. Amen. So we live our lives with a sin conscious and we need to reconcile our theology with the reality of, of the cross. This is church. This is your get out of free, get out of jail free card. This is your get out of jail free card. The prison doors are wide open this morning, child of God. Walk out. Walk out of that sin conscience this morning and into the righteousness of God this morning. You've been made righteous through Jesus Christ. Amen. Final point. You're extremely valuable to God. You are extremely valuable to God. The value of something is determined by two things. Who the owner is and what somebody is willing to pay for it. Who the owner is and what someone's willing to pay for it. You are a child of God and you have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 23. Jesus paid for you with his life. That's how valuable you are. Jesus paid for you with his life. That's how valuable you are. If God wanted, God could have sent a chief angel to come and die in your place. But that would determine your value. 
you'd be as valuable as an angel that died for you. But because Jesus died for you, you are as valuable as Jesus is to the Father. Now again, you're going to get some, ooh, that's too deep for me. I need to go home and go read that up. You are as valuable to the Father as Jesus is to the Father. Because your value is determined by the price that was paid for you. When God sees you, He sees you like He sees the Son. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah this morning. Amen. And as I said, if we get a hold of these things, it's going to change our mentality, change the way we go forward. Praise God for that. That's how valuable you are. Say with me, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. In Genesis chapter 1, after God concluded creation, He said, plants will produce after their kind. Fish will produce after their kind. Birds, you'll produce after their, your kind. But when it came to man, he said, let us make man in our image. You are little gods. Small letter G, O-D-S. Created in the image of God. When Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Jews before Abraham was, I am, they said, who are you to put yourself in the same position with God? Jesus said, in the word, do I not call you gods? So fish produce fish. Birds produce birds. What does God produce? That's who you are. That's who you are. Get a revelation of who you are and you'll see your value that you attach to yourself will change. Hallelujah. In the story of the Good Samaritan, he was willing to step down and pick up a broken man. When it came to Mephibosheth, he was willing to raise him up to the king's table. The woman taken in adultery, he, he was willing to forgive her and he said, neither do I condemn you. Hallelujah. You're valuable. Valuable and precious on the sight of God. Now let me come back to Jeremiah 1 verse 5. I touched on it. And in Jeremiah 1 verse 5, God says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. There's two things you need to take with you from Jeremiah 1 and 5 this morning. Two things. Number one, you have got what is called prior acceptance. Prior acceptance. God determined before you were born, He's going to accept you. So don't, don't debate that this morning. Don't say, I wonder if I'm a Christian or not. I wonder if I'm truly saved. Am I really like all the other Christians? Don't doubt all of that. God determined that He was going to accept you before you were born. Listen to this. The church is not an SPCA for stray souls. Oh, nobody wants that person there. That family rejected that man. Oh, you can come to church. We, we don't mind. Come. One, come, one, come, all. This is not an SPCA for stray souls. This is a place for appointed people. Amen. This is a place for people that have been prior, elected by God. And so we value you. You've been elected, chosen before the foundations of the earth. You're not just somebody that came because of somebody. We know who you are. God knew you before the foundations of the earth. Number one, you've got prior acceptance. Number two, your purpose and your destiny is locked up in God. Child of God, I'm bringing things to close. But if you've been wondering all through life, why was I born? Why was I born? Your purpose and your destiny is locked up in God. Amen. Turn to Him this morning. That's going to be our closing point and our closing prayer. Turn to Him this morning. You may be wondering, why am I born on earth? Well, what did God put me on earth for? He knows your purpose. He knows what sex you should be. He knows what race you should be. He knows how high, how tall, how short. He had everything determined because God fashioned you in such a way that you will fit the profile for what He destined you for. Amen. Never ever look in the mirror and say, why did He make me taller, shorter, more handsome, more this, more that? You are made perfectly in the sight of God. Amen. And you are fit for your destiny. Praise God. So there's two things, prior acceptance and secondly, your destiny is locked up in Him. And I'm going to pray that in closing that your destiny will unfold. Listen to this prophetic word in closing. You've been on the highway and the byway. Perhaps in your hunger, in your desperation, you veered off the way. But now, now, now is the time for you to return and to be who God always wanted you to be and created you to be. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been and what you have believed, God has had His eyes on you waiting for this moment. It's not just that He wants to save you from the dark or difficulties of time, but God wants to bring to life the purpose of your life that perhaps 
you could never find and has been so difficult so far. You went searching for some kind of fulfillment and all of this time, God's been searching for the seed hidden deep inside of you. You will reach people that I cannot reach. You carry something in your heart that we do not have. Someone somewhere in the world is waiting for you. Amen. Somewhere, somewhere in the world, someone's waiting for you. When you begin to see yourself as valuable and precious, you begin to treat yourself as valuable and precious. And then you begin to treat others as valuable and precious. Amen. Hallelujah. Are we settled with that this morning? Amen. Amen. All those points. Bringing things to a close. You know, the ship always comes in slow into the harbor. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's not a jet that just lands. The ship always comes in slow, but we are closing. Your worth is not determined by how people treat you, but by how you perceive yourself in Him. Say it this morning again. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child. First thing the prodigal father did, or the father of the prodigal son, to put a robe on him. Doesn't look right. Put sandals on his feet. Put a ring of authority on his finger. He must look like me. He must resemble me. That's what the father said. And that's what the father is saying to you. He wants to dress you accordingly. You're valuable and precious. Now listen to this. The Bible promises us the new heavens and the new earth. Book of Revelation. How many of you are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth? No more COVID-19, no more pandemic, no more walking around with masks, no more all this stuff, amen. It's going to be done away with new heavens and the new earth. Listen to this. The new heaven and the new earth, it's not God's idea of renovation. It's not that he's tired of all the paper in heaven. What's this whole renovation scheme all about? It's because of you. He's doing it because of you. He's doing it because of you. And he's doing it for me. That's how much you are worth to him. That's a valuable law. Amen. Now, if he can do that for you, think about what he's willing to do for you right here, right now, on earth. He's willing to move heaven and earth in a manner of speaking. And the gospel message is, for God so loved the world, God lost you to sin, but now he's found you again, and he's not going to let you go. His love is so possessive. Amen. Praise God. Every head bowed and all eyes closed. When you remember that you are accepted, loved, forgiven and valuable to the creator of the universe, you'll be better equipped to show love to others. So Father, this morning, thank you that we are completely, totally accepted. We are unconditionally loved. We are forgiven, totally forgiven. And we are absolutely, absolutely valuable in your sight. Father, we take home with us all four points. We receive it, we recognize it, and we realize that it's all because of Jesus that you have done this for us. So we say thank you all this morning. Thank you, Lord, as we receive the love of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen.